All right, guys, this morning I am with Biscuit Nutrition. I'm with Kara and Braden, who uh, are both with Biscuit Nutrition, and, and we've been doing some things with Fit for Function to kind of add that nutrition component to aging, pain recovery, um, fighting inflammation, and those types of things. So uh, I thought it'd be fun to get these guys on a call and uh, just kind of talk about what is inflammation, how does food uh, and inflammation, how does that, that kind of fit in? And then um, Braden's going to kind of dive into how oxidation affects aging and, and cell repair and, and some of those things. So um, should be a fun one, kind of diving into some a little more in-depth topics of how food relates to inflammation. Uh, we talk a lot about pain and inflammation and, and kind of how those responses go, but uh, the nutrition side is, is so important. So um, do you guys want to introduce yourself before we kind of get rolling? Yeah. Uh, hey guys, I am Braden Yakabuchi. I am a registered dietitian with Biscuit Nutrition uh, and a coach, a CrossFit coach at uh, CrossFit Cadre over in Hudson, Ohio. And my name is Kara Barton, and you guys probably know me from the West and CLE offices of FIT. And then I'm also a nutrition coach with Biscuit Nutrition. Awesome. So let's dive right in. Let's talk about, you know, we talk a lot about inflammation. Um, you know, and Brayden, in, in your opinion, what is inflammation? And then how does, how does our diet, how does food fit, fit into that picture? Yeah, so inflammation itself is actually a natural process, Right. Uh, it happens when we basically place our bodies under some sort of stress. Um, that could be anything from emotional stress to uh, physical stress. So, for example, if you're working out in the gym, you're tearing up your muscle fibers, um, inflammation is going to uh, help repair the muscles. Um, with stress, that can lead to uh, brain inflammation. Um, or if you have an injury as well. So uh, if you have some sort of cut or something like that, um, inflammation is what is going to get blood, more blood into the wounded area uh, and help to repair the tissue that was damaged in those cells. So inflammation itself is not a bad thing. We need inflammation in order to heal. The problem is where we have chronic inflammation. Our bodies are not designed to be in these states of stress all of the time. So maybe that looks like you are working out seven days a week, never giving your body a rest. Maybe it looks like you're stressed out all the time about job, work, family, whatever it is. Um, and therefore you're in a chronic state of inflammation. So that is when it becomes detrimental to our health. Um, Long term, it does, uh, it can actually just speed up the aging process because it takes such a toll on our bodies because our bodies essentially feel like they, your body likes to respond to the most pressing concern. Okay. So a lot of times that could be digestion, um, is a, takes a lot of energy for the body. So, uh, maybe the body's focusing on digestion. Um, but with inflammation, if you're placing your body under stress all the time, it, it essentially thinks, holy crap, okay, we need to fix this, 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 this. And it, it really wears out the body uh, much quicker, if you can imagine, than uh, if we were to reduce our stress, re uh, actually take time to recover from workouts um, and things like that. Yeah, I think, I think you make a good point that we talk a lot about inflammation and we're always taking advantage of that inflammatory resp response because that's how cell repair happens. Um, yes. How, how does that fit in on the, on the food side of things, right? So when we talk about food and inflammation, I think there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of buzz out there about inflammatory foods and leaky mm -hmm. gut. Um, how, how does that in your mind, how does that, how do those things tie together? Yeah. Food has a humongous impact on inflammation. Um, essentially added sugars, processed foods, a lot of things that we typically find in the American diet are going to unfortunately increase inflammation. Part of that is because our bodies aren't uh, necessarily used to the, uh, um, the certain kinds of foods that we are putting into our bodies. Um, and therefore it doesn't know how to handle it as well or break it down as well. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, a lot of the like fake sugars and processed food ingredients, and processed foods, they're synthetic. Um, and that's why our bodies don't really know they're man-made, I should say. So our bodies don't really know how to handle them as well as natural foods or whole foods. So, um, 
that and then like i said the added sugar also uh drastically increases inflammation so you talked about you mentioned leaky gut um so that actually uh diverticulosis and diverticulitis are two um symptoms of a uh, high processed food uh and added sugar diet because uh they can actually lead to inflammation in the digestive system which is what causes the leaks to appear. Uh, essentially, there are holes that form in your small intestine, in your gut, um, and that can lead to inflamed pockets called diverticuli. So uh, inflammation can lead to all of these different chronic disease states. Um, and that's part of the reason that we see so much chronic disease in America nowadays. Um, I mean, it's the, the statistics are just staggering with these. Uh, if you ever look it up, the amount of people in America that have some sort of chronic disease, and a lot of it is diet related. A lot of people want to say it's genetic, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of it is because of our typical American diet. So um, chronic inflammation can lead to all these different things, um, the different disease states. So uh, yeah, food definitely plays a major role in that. What? Brandon, I want to oh, so, Nick. Oh, no, go ahead, Kara. I, I was going to dive into that a little bit. <laughs> Same. Um, I'll dive in first then. So one part that I do want to kind of bring to surface as well, because you were talking about how the diet has changed from the past to the current standard American diet. Um, and one of the big things when you're talking about the different types of synthetic foods is also um, vegetable oils and the increased uh, use of omega-6s in our diet. And how the mm. ratio of omega six to omega threes are is, you know, significantly larger than what it used to be. When really it should be like a three to one ratio or lower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we actually we need both omega six and omega three fatty acids, mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of times are found in, like you said, oils or seafood. Most of the time, especially those omega threes. So yeah, we should have a ratio of like three to one omega three to omega six respectively. Uh, but unfortunately, due to the like you said, fake, uh, a lot of it is these um, saturated fats and trans mm -hmm. fats that pop up in the diet um, that lead to increased omega-6 intake. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that definitely increases inflammation yeah. in the body. What? So typical, oh, <laughs> uh, again, I, I, just to dive into that before we kind of just kind of skim it. Um, yeah, yeah, it's been a while since I, I, I've read about omega-6s and omega-3s and um, you know, I've seen a lot about trying to improve that ratio, whether that's through reducing sixes or increasing threes. What's, mm -hmm. what's the mechanism behind that? Or how does that work within the body? Like, why is that so important? So uh, essentially, it has to do with the structure uh, of omega sixes and omega threes. Uh, and to be honest with you, it's been a while since I have dove into that myself. Um, so I can't fully explain the mechanism behind it. Um, and I'm not going to act like I'm some sort of genius who can break it down perfectly for you. Um, I'll be honest and just say that uh, I, it's been a while uh, since I've dove into that. But essentially, I mean, omega-3s um, have to do with balancing out your um, fed the uh, positive fatty acids in the body. Um, we want as we know, majority of unsaturated fatty acids as opposed to saturated and trans fats. A lot of people understand that about the diet, at least. Um, so getting in the omega-3 fatty acids is going to help with uh, joint mobility. Um, it's going to help with a uh, healthy digestive system, um, producing um, short-chain fatty acids and medium-chain fatty acids, stuff like that. And yeah. Nick, you you made that comment of you know not, not really knowing whether we're supposed to be increasing omega threes or decreasing omega sixes. Typically, if people take the route of trying to get in, you know, mixed seed, uh, mixed nuts and seeds, and olive oil, um, fish oils, but like obviously are, and fish, they're also going to be getting their omega sixes from the lean animal sources that they're eating. So at the end of the day, you're not really seeking out omega sixes, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, I did. Um, Rob Wolf, I forget, I don't remember what his book was anymore, but uh, he, he was big into that. And they had a calculator of like trying to balance that ratio. And I was actually doing shots of Carlson's fish oil. It was like this lemon flavored <laughs> fish oil. And like, because they wanted you to take in this enormous amount of omega threes. 
And mm. uh, to do it through a pill form was absurdly expensive, but you could buy a bottle of fish oil and you could shoot it like a shot. It was awful. <laughs> awful. How long did yeah. you do that for? Uh, it's been a while. Um, I mean, we're talking probably six years ago or so, but uh, I bet I did it for a few months. I, I honestly didn't notice much, you know, I in mean, the scheme of things that affect kind of how you feel, I didn't notice too much with it. Um, yeah. but, but I definitely did it for a while. I bought like fish oil is like fish oil is like one that. of the supplements that I can, uh, most of the time recommend to people, especially if they don't live close to water, uh, or consume a lot of seafood, because like I said, that, that isn't the only source, but that's a really good source of omega threes. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, you just have to make sure with supplements that, uh, it's a quality, uh, brand that you're getting it from like nature made is a good one. Um, and you just want to check on the source of where they get their supplement. Um, yeah. so if you guys do decide to do a fish oil, just make sure it's a quality brand, reputable yeah. brand. I remember them that talking about like the pills, if they've been sitting on the shelf long enough, that, that omega three can actually break down. Like it can become like, almost yeah. like a rancid oil in there. Yeah. Um, well, I same thing with extra virgin olive oil. That's why you're actually supposed to keep extra virgin olive oil in opaque containers um, as opposed to clear because the uh, light can actually break down those positive fatty acids in the oil. Yeah. If they're selling you real uh, olive oil, you're, you see yes. Mark Hyman's <laughs> book where they're like, it's like one of the biggest counterfeit schemes coming out of Italy. Oh, really? Selling fake oils. Yeah. I haven't the seen markup, this. The markup on like good extra virgin olive oil and oh. uh, Maduka honey is the other one. The honey out of New Zealand. People, oh, man. people counterfeit it. I, I mean, it makes sense. Like people really, if you get a bottle with some like Italian scene on it and some olives, people like, I'll pay $17 for that. Sure. Yeah. Sounds but, great. Yeah. You know, at the same time, I've also seen olive oil being sold in very weird places like TJ Maxx. Like, who comes to TJ Maxx to buy <laughs> olive oil? <laughs> but then you got whole store. shops you got like that shop in sugar and falls like yes. that's what they sell is oil like they sell yes. olive oil. Uh, I can't all of my heart that. in uh hudson as well is there one in hudson too there you go yeah 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 so, anyway. anyways we went off track a little bit yeah. there with those yeah. oils um bringing it back to inflammation um so, yeah so what's so, the role of sugar the sugar um and, and this is kind of my personal interest right now um i'm actually playing around with um uh, the freestyle Libre, like it's a, it's a thing you can wear and like kind of check your blood sugar all the time. What's oh, the role okay. of sugar and inflammation and insulin and glue? Like, uh, um, I want to say glucose, but that's not the word I'm looking for. Um, this is that, this is that baby brain in I was talking about. Insulin. Insulin. What's the, what's uh, the counter hormone to, Oh, glucagon. You're saying you you're looking yeah. for. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. I got you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, basically, added sugar, what it does is spike your blood sugar because it's super easy to break down, right? Um, so because of that spike in blood sugar, um, there's essentially, it can, over time, if you're consuming a lot of added sugar, it will lead to, uh, so what happens when you take in sugar, any form of sugar or carbohydrate is uh, the body has to release what's called insulin, uh, from the body and insulin is essentially acts like the key to allow glucose into cells to energize cells. Okay. So without insulin, we would not be able to essentially like have as much energy and our body would not be able to function as properly as it could. Um, so with those quick sugars, if your body has way too much sugar in it over time, uh, then it will cause insulin resistance. Um, and therefore insulin is not going to act as effectively as it could, uh, if you were eating more complex carbohydrates and, uh, the body breaks them down a little bit slower and is able to handle that super high load of sugar, um, more easily than if it's just simple sugar. So that's why we say avoid all those simple sugars. Um, but that's where type two diabetes comes in. Um, is when we have, uh, so again, this is one thing that is related to inflammation is type two diabetes. And it's one, a very, it's becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, and even among kids nowadays in America, unfortunately. Um, so increased, uh, added sugar intake 
over time, simple sugar intake uh, leads to increased insulin resistance, which means insulin isn't working as well, uh, which means our cells aren't getting as much glucose, which leads to type 2 diabetes. So it's a really negative um, downstream effect. Um, but as for sugar related to inflammation, it's uh, mostly related to that increased uh, spike in blood sugar, um, that constant spike, spike, spike uh, that has a negative effect on the inflama inflammatory response, basically. If that makes I sense. I think it's really important to even bring up the fact that they're really linking sugar to Alzheimer's and dementia in late stages as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that can, yeah, that, if you're talking about that specifically, that is related to brain inflammation, um, mm -hmm. which is also related to that increased sugar intake. Um, your, your brain does uh, is fueled off of carbohydrates, but simple carbohydrates and too many at a time um, are definitely not not good for it. So, um, yeah. yeah, the inflammation of the brain over time is what can lead to some of those cognitive uh, decline disorders, such as dementia and Alzheimer's. Yeah, the fascinating topic. Um, you know, this. You know, when I was in school, there was a blood brain barrier and inflammation in the bloodstream isn't getting to the brain, right? And, and mm -hmm. that blood brain barrier is able to separate those things. And now we're, I think, pretty aware that through, through the lymphatic system, the, the glymphatic, which drains the brain is, is yep. maybe, maybe there is not quite the barrier that we thought. And in certain things like exercise and, and other things increase the permeability of that blood brain barrier, um, mm -hmm. which just changes the whole game when you talk about food and stress and inflammation exercise because now it's not just it's not just body composition anymore right it's your it's your brain health right it's yeah. we're talking you know i mean all, just all these different things think about how much the brain does on a day-to-day -day basis it's our it's without a doubt our most important organ it's one of those complex things in the universe and we so a lot of people say that we can only use 10% total of our brains, but it's only portions at a time. That's what that means. We can only use certain sections of the brain. We can't use hundred percent of the brain's capacity at one point in time. It's not necessarily like we can only use 10% of our brains. No, it's just at one period of time, but yeah, the blood brain barrier is, uh, that's another reason we suggest, uh, a lot of short, uh, the brain is made of fat. Okay. So that's why we recommend those, uh, unsaturated fats and the omega threes, uh, is because they actually improve the health of your brain as well, uh, and can slow down any cognitive decline that may be happening. Uh, I mean, that, that happens naturally with age, right? Um, but yes, that, so those short chain fatty acids are very beneficial for, uh, the blood, the, the blood brain barrier, but the brain itself. So a part of that conversation is oxidative stress and, and kind of how that affects cell repair and, and cell regeneration and that kind of stuff. What is oxidative stress? Um, I have a very crude understanding of it. Um, mm -hmm. How does that affect the aging and cell repair process? And then, uh, you know, mm -hmm. obviously we'll dive into kind of how food plays into that, but what, what is, what yeah. is oxidation and, and how does that play? Yeah. So oxidation is actually a natural process. It's impossible to stop completely. Uh, everything from sunlight to pollution to uh, chemicals in the food supply can increase oxidation. But oxidation itself, uh, there's these things called free radicals that are floating around in your bloodstream. Um, and then also reactive oxygen species. So what, both of these free, things. What is a free radical? Like what, yeah. what role does it play in the body? Yeah. So both of these things are very, they're, it's, it's called reactive. Uh, they want to bind to other things. Okay. Um, they are essentially just molecules uh, that are not complete, if that makes sense. It's sort of like uh, Tom without Jerry. And it's, it's always searching for that, for that Jerry, that's something to latch onto. Okay. So with increased free radicals in reactive oxygen species, um, floating around in the bloodstream, uh, they tend to grab onto electrons of other uh, cells and they actually damage the cells by doing so. Um, so 
that is why we want to reduce oxidation as much as possible, um, because when these free radicals and reactive oxygen species are just willy-nilly grabbing onto stuff, um, that causes increased cell damage, uh, which can over time leads to like increased wrinkles in the face is a big one, um, and just the continuous breakdown of the body essentially. Um, so that's why we say aging um, in the title is because oxidation can, if you have more oxidation, it can increase the aging process. So, so essentially, so essentially you're saying that oxidative process is, is damaging cells. Um, yeah. It's sort of weird. It's like, a na it's a natural thing that yeah. Yeah. our bodies just do and no one, you can't fully stop it. Um, but we can do certain things to slow it down. Um, so those certain things would be to, uh, everyone's sort of antioxidants, right? What's it, what, um, and again, this is, this is my lack of understanding here, but what sorry. is it's like baseline role? Like inflammation is there to, to clear out bad signals, right? Whether it's a, a damaged cell or it's a, um, a stranger signal, like a foreign substance in the body. That's what it's there for is to clear that out. What are the purpose right. of free radicals? It's kind of the byproduct of natural things that are occurring. So if you're exercising, you have okay, an infection so just, or a straight knee, it's those right. byproducts. It's just simply yep. a byproduct. And then you need things to, to try to break that down, get those out of there. Correct. That makes yep. sense. Yep. So yeah, that's a good point to make. Yeah, these, these things aren't like you don't ingest free radicals, nothing like that. Um, they're essentially, yeah, like she said, results of natural processes that happen all the time in our bodies. Um, so. The next question obviously is how do we combat oxidation? And the answer to that is consuming a good amount of antioxidants. Uh, now, antioxidants is a very broad term. There's a lot of different antioxidants, but um, some big ones to note are the ones called anthocyanins uh, and flavonoids. So these two things are essentially pigments um, at give certain foods their colors, uh, like a purplish or reddish hue. Okay. Um, so like blueberries, uh, any, any sort of berry is going to have a good amount of antioxidants. Um, some other good sources of antioxidants, not necessarily, uh, berries or I'm sorry, not necessarily flavonoids or anthocyanins are going to be, uh, like nuts and seeds are really good. Extra virgin olive oil, another really good source. Um, but what these antioxidants do is they offer up, um, basically they, they offer up themselves as attachments. Okay. So, um, they have compounds in them that will attach to those free radicals and reactive oxygen species, uh, so that those bad things don't want to attach to other cells and damage those cells. So, it's sort of like pumping your blood full of Jerry's, if we go back to that analogy, um, so that they can link up and then everything's a okay. So in the scheme of things, what's a better strategy trying to reduce free radicals or consume more antioxidants? Or is it just we're combining these things? Uh, there isn't really a way to decrease free radicals. Like I said, it just happens naturally. So it's definitely the better choice is to consume um, antioxidants in the diet as much as possible. So like a serving a day of berries is plenty uh, enough. Like a thing of cranberry juice, great. Um, a handful of nuts and seeds, great. Uh, maybe a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil, great. Um, so I forgot to mention the, how does, okay. So how does oxidation link to inflammation is the next question. So instead of just going straight to oxidation and not talking about inflammation, we have to link them together. So basically um, those free radicals floating around uh, in the reactive oxygen species, um, they are harmful to the body. And as we said at the beginning of the podcast, anything that's going to place the body under stress and uh, harm uh, essentially increases the inflammatory process. So the more free radicals and reactive oxygen species that we have floating around, um, the more that we are going to see inflammation. And what, like I said, one of the things that does increase it, so this is, I guess, a way to decrease it, 
uh, the amount of free radicals is um, chemicals in the food supply. So eating or, an organic diet, uh, certified organic diet is one way to reduce the um, free radicals and reactive oxygen species in the body um, because consuming more of those um, essentially increases those numbers and leads to increased inflammation. So really, we just want to stay away from anything synthetic is what we're saying as much as possible uh, to avoid increased inflammation and increased oxidation. Does that make sense? I sort of went on in a circle there, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think I think I, I think I understand where you're going with it. I mean, if we cell repair is the name of the game, right? And if damaged yes. cells are able to replicate, bad things happen. So if we can repair those damaged cells or, or kind of clear them out, then, uh, then regeneration and healing occurs. And, and that's kind of the, the nature of the beast. And, and um, yeah. the oxidative side of it is just something I haven't inflammations near and dear to the rehab game, right? Like injuries yeah. cause inflammation, inflammation is part of the healing process. So, you know, a deep, deep understanding of what's happening there, but um, how the oxidative process fits into that is, is just something that, that I'm learning and uh, it's, that's cool stuff. So very, very interesting piece of the, the aging process. So mm -hmm. as, as we kind of wind this down, if you could give people, you know, a, a quick tidbit, and we should also mention that you guys have put together a free kind of uh, PDF version of, of some of this information in our uh, recovery corner that's available at Fit for Function and, and with yes. some of our, our people. So there's definitely a place to read more about this. But if you could give people kind of a, you know, a, a quick rundown of, uh, we mentioned avoid synthetic foods, um, we talk about organic and chemical kind of things. What's the biggest take home for the average person? Having a diet that is um, like fiber rich whole grains, like your nuts and seeds and your deep colorful fruits and vegetables that they that should be a, a staple every single day and not just you know once a week like most standard american diets are mm -hmm. yeah uh the a good place to look is the mediterranean diet food list mm -hmm. um is going to be packed with anti-inflammatories and anti uh oxidants in it so um like kara said i mean it doesn't even have to be anything crazy. Uh, just make sure you get one serving of a deep colored vegetable or fruit daily, ideally more than that. Um, cook with extra virgin olive oil. Uh, unless you're cooking above medium high heat, then use uh, a different oil like canola or um, coconut oil. And then um, nuts and seeds are going to be the other one um because you can't stop these processes they're going to happen all you can do is do your best to slow them down so we're not saying stop exercising we're not saying you can never be stressed out that's ridiculous in our world today we are constantly going to be under some sort of stress with phones and social media and the internet and all this crazy stuff that goes on kids whatever um so it's going to happen the best thing you can do is just make sure that you, like Kara said, have a whole foods diet as much as possible, reduce those synthetic foods, um, and try to just uh, get some colors, get some colors in the diet. That's the best way to combat these two things. Yeah. I've been doing some of my own reading on, on anti-aging and that kind of stuff. And the Mediterranean diet is, is certainly one that continues to, to pop up. Yeah. And it's just not, it's not even like a difficult diet. It's mm -hmm. just how they eat right. in it's those just, yeah. countries. It's like, you're not, you're not restricting carbohydrates, like the keto diet. You're not only eating meat, like the Atkins diet, whatever. Like it's just straight up eat foods from this pretty long, honestly, list of delicious foods and you'll live longer. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Sounds great. Let me go ahead and do that. <laughs> easier said than done sometimes. <clears throat> True. True. Um, next time uh, I, I want to definitely do this again. Next time I want to dive into, um, which I think is kind of the other buzz right now, which is, is fasting. And, and I don't want to mm. dive into that just now, but uh, maybe next time we hop on a call, because when you start talking about cell repair and, and regeneration and stuff, I think fasting and whether you're talking intermittent fasting or um, kind of these longer version fasts that Kara loves so much. Um, yeah. <laughs> me the time Nick tried to kill me. <laughs> hey starving here who gets, a COVID? <laughs> who gets their vaccine on a fast oh that was well 
was mostly most the greatest time. The, let's uh, let's put our immune system under a, a, a high challenge. With my immune no... system did not do well. I just got COVID instead. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. Uh, anyway, good. anyway, uh, but I would yeah. like to I would like to dive down that kind of part two of this um kind of yeah. dive into to your opinion on how all that plays in and, and how those things interrelate um because i think that'd be awesome that seems to be that seems to be when you start looking at the different authors that are out there and in, in, in um things the fasting is the next buzz right like that's what everybody's talking about now so it's huge yeah, yeah. Curious it's really big how you guys and that's something that. that yeah that's something that and we'll dive into this more in depth but um there's a couple different modes of fasting so it's not just like one size fits all there are definitely yeah. like options that you can look into so yeah yeah the research is pretty new on that but i'd love to dive into that next time that'd be yeah, awesome we'll do, we'll do that one next time so as we kind of wrap it up where can guy where can uh where can people find more about you guys and uh what you do and, and all that kind of stuff Kara, you want to take that one uh, yeah i'll go right ahead so we can be found at biscuitnutrition.com and then both Braden and I, we can be, I can be found at care at biscuitnutrition.com if you want to reach out with any questions with emails or Braden at Braden at biscuitnutrition.com. And like and then said, social media, our, um, yeah. Biscuit Nutrition, Facebook, uh, Instagram, all that good and stuff. We typed up all sorts of fun information that's at the recovery corners at all the fit locations. Yeah. So yeah. fitforfunction.com, our free online courses. Um, if you get into that recovery corner, um, there's going to be a, a really nice, really nicely done PDF with a lot of great information on there for you. Um, just to kind of tie in all the kind of hot topic, uh, things that we talked about here in this, this short podcast. Love it. Cool. All right, guys. Uh, we'll do it again. Like I said, part two, we'll, we'll get it set up. <laughs> cool. Thank you for having Sounds me. Perfect. Really appreciate it, Nick.